Welcome to this latest episode of Authors in Conversation with me, Ian Martin. I'm the editor of Reaction. And I'm joined by the author of uh, The Weaponization of Everything, A Field Guide to the New Way of War, Mark Galliotti's fascinating new book. Mark, welcome. Oh, it's good to be here. So I want to begin by talking about one of your earlier books, very prescient, published in 2019. We need to talk about Putin, how the West gets him wrong. And in that book, you explain how people misunderstand this guy's basics of political philosophy and, and psych, psychology and motivation. Yeah, I mean, in, in part, I mean, the, the book is, and frankly, uh, an unalloyed rant um, exactly about certain particular aspects of the whole kind of field of Putinology, shall we say, that it emerged, and the degree to which a series of myths emerged about Putin, the grand geopolitical chess player, Putin, the KGB agent deeply steeped in their arts and so forth. And things that therefore I think not only actually play to Putin, helping build up his myth, which is one of his powerful instruments that he deploys, but also means that we have a tendency to, to misunderstand what's going on. And look, it's not that I can't make mistakes as well. It's not that I'm just saying everyone else is wrong about Putin and only I have, have the keys to his heart and vision to his soul, of course not. But on the other hand, what I think we can do is identify certain sort of past practices and tracks and essentially how this is a, a rather shallow opportunist rather than some grand ideological figurehead. And does that help explain, do you think, the way in which he's got himself and much worse, the, the Ukrainians, but who are fighting back very bravely. But does that help explain how he's got himself into this mess because you couldn't conceivably be a master sort of chess player and grand global strategist and end up in this situation with Russia having failed in its principal uh, war objective so far uh, after more than a month. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's one particular characteristic that I think is worth bringing out. Putin himself likes to compare him, his kind of trajectory with that of Yuri Andropov, who was a former head of the KGB, who then rose briefly to become general secretary. I say briefly because his kidneys quickly gave out and who spent most of his time ruling the country from dialysis. Mm. But nonetheless, I think this is the idea that he thinks of himself as. And Andropov really was uh, a cold, very clear-eyed, ruthless, entirely individual. However, unlike Andropov, Putin clearly enjoys being surrounded by a circle of yes-men. One of Andropov's key desires was always to actually have the most accurate information available. I mean, for example, it's a weird little statistic, but I think very telling, is during Andropov's year in power, it looked as if the Soviet crime rate skyrocketed. And it's not actually that there was any more crime in that period. It's just that he wanted real figures rather than the successively padded figures, which previous Soviet leaders had been perfectly happy to consume. So Andropov wanted to know the facts, even if they were uncomfortable ones. Compare that with Putin, who it's clear for years now has become increasingly intolerant of any perspectives that challenge his own prejudices. I remember talking to a, a former Russian spy some years ago, who said that you know, they've learned you do not bring bad news to the Tsar's table. Um, you don't tell him what he needs to hear, you tell him what he wants to hear. And I think this is exactly what we have seen with Ukraine. He clearly had this vision. I mean, you know, we know that he doesn't think Ukraine is a real country. He doesn't think the Ukrainians are a real people. And therefore his view was clearly that at the very first push, the whole Ukrainian state would collapse. And so this wasn't gonna be really a war. You know, we saw this side of a sort of couple of companies of paratroopers motoring, motoring into Kyiv as if they could just go along and arrest the government and impose a new one and that would be the end of that. Mm. Of course, he totally misunderstood what was going on. He was in many ways, not just badly led and bamboozled by the people around him, but also ripped off. I mean, we know that the um, one, one of the deputy heads of the Federal Security Service, Colonel General Biseda, is currently in house arrest. Well, part of the reason is he was responsible for billions that was meant to be being spent on cultivating fifth columnists throughout Ukraine. Clearly, there was meant to be this whole army of politicians and fighters and whatever else, who at the key moment, Vrenyacha, as the Russians would put it, zero hour, would rise up to support the Russians. And clearly he'd done nothing of the sort and presumably a large amount ended up in his pocket. 
Um, and this is exactly what, what, what Putin has basically built around him. He built a fantasy kingdom in which people would simply flatter him. And that's fine unless and until your fantasy kingdom impacts with the real world. And this is precisely what the Ukrainians are doing. And having made those mistakes for the reasons that you, you, you just explained, what are his options? What does he do next? How does someone who, who is, as you describe him, this serial opportunist, how far could he go in, in terms of trying to rescue the situation? Mm. This is a big problem now, because we also have to realise that, I mean, since I wrote that book on Putin, there has been clearly a change in the man. And it's not just because he's a bit older and so forth. I mean, there, there is something going on. Some people have, have speculated that he's ill and on steroids. Some people have said it's to do with the deep isolation that he was in during the COVID era, where he was in this extraordinary biosecurity bubble. Others have simply said it's, it's just age. I mean, this is a man who in October will be 70. Although he can stay in power, there must be that degree to which he feels that his opportunity to make his mark in history is a finite one. And we know that he's desperate to think about how historians in the future will rate him effectively as, as another Russian czar. And this has brought about this much more emotional, much darker Putin than we've seen. Not the, the, the cold, grey chief executive of the nation, but an angry old man in a hurry. And in that circumstance, you know, again, in part, we don't really know what he's being told about the situation. I mean, he must have some sense that he's not winning. He must be seeing the, the maps with the battle lines. He must be seeing the casualty figures. But quite how that's being sugarcoated or presented, we don't know. And the second thing is exactly what is his, now his appetite for risk? In the past, despite all his macho persona, he was actually very risk averse. He was willing to use violence and whatever, but he would always try and reckon that he had planned it out and knew what the outcome was going to be. Now, clearly, he's in much more of a gambling mood. So, I mean, I think just because of the realities of the battlefield, clearly the Russians are not going to take Ukraine. They're not even going to take eastern Ukraine. They're now consolidating in the east, in the very east of the country, and the southeast, the Donbass region, and the region along the northern shores of the Azov Sea. They can probably hold that. It's where their supply lines are shortest, and they can actually sort of pulse quite a few forces in there. And so we're probably in a situation where neither the Russians nor the Ukrainians can deliver a knockout blow. Now, is Putin going to be willing to settle for what is essentially a long, painful and bloody deadlock? Or will he be looking for some desperate strike that will actually break that? I mean, this is why people are worrying about whether he might use chemical weapons mm. or even a tactical nuclear weapon. I honestly don't know if he will for practical reasons rather than because he has any moral constraints. We've, we, we've seen that in towns like Bucha, where there's clearly been, been massacres of Ukrainians. But I think this is the problem. At the moment, we are dealing with a, with a Putin whom we've not really encountered before. And therefore, it's hard to, to game play what we, th we think he will do. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it makes him very, uh, you know, very dangerous. But what, what, what's your instinct? I mean, he's, he, he, you paint a really convincing picture of him in, uh, in, in that 2019 book. And the West having got him broadly wrong, not, you know, not, not everyone was kind of taken in or, or adopted the, the Merkelist approach of essentially thinking that it was containable, manageable. There were, other vo there were other voices. But now the West having been wrong in the first place, do you think our leadership class, the politicians, strategists, I mean, it's a really difficult choice they have, have to make mm. in terms of gauging how he'll, how he'll behave. Exactly. And I suspect that what he will do is rely, rely on a tactic that he's done in the past, which is, look, he's around for as long as mortality and his own choice allows him. Whereas he knows that Western politicians, they, they change. And he has a sense that, frankly, Western society is an attention deficit disorder society. That today we are absolutely fixed on this crisis and this is the most important challenge we face and then, oh, shiny, something else will, will distract mm. us. There'll be a, a conflagration in, the, in the, the Middle East or North Africa or something else. So, I mean, my, my suspicion is that for the moment he will be willing to retrench and essentially wait and see, wait and see if the Ukrainians overreach themselves 
wait and see what happens with the West, see if precisely um, a desire to maintain supplies of not just Russian oil and gas, but a whole variety of other resources. I mean, we've got to remember that, that the Russia ex exports everything from grain to rare metals. Um, you know, at what point do we begin to sidle towards some kind of return to business as usual? Mm. Now, I'm not convinced that'll happen, or at least not as extensively and as quickly as Putin probably thinks. Again, just as he has a certain idée fixe about the Ukrainians, I think he has a certain notion about the West that is perhaps a little bit too caricatured, but not entirely so. I mean, we know there are already now voices which were sort of are more or less inclining, or at least were before the, the news of the, of the massacre at Bucha came out, but were sort of hinting that maybe Zelensky ought to be a little bit more sensible. Sensible, of course, being a euphemism for make concessions to the Russians because we really don't like what's going on at the moment. Mm. So I think that's it. He will rely on a, a sense of the West's incapacity to think and plan and maintain effort long term and hope that in six months, a year, maybe even six years, if he's got that in him, he'll have, be able to have another go. Yeah, I mean, that that's the concern, isn't it, among those who take a more robust view that he must be completely defeated and 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 driven out and that suggestion denied um possibly for diplomatic reasons that this the potential for a split between us and, U and the uk on one hand uh, and france and germany who might want mm -hmm. a return to something uh, closer to um, normality in terms of trade now after the massacres and the atrocities that becomes certainly more difficult to justify in the short term, doesn't it? And actually probably strengthens the hand of those who are arguing for a maximalist, much tougher, uh, long sort of long war approach in which he's completely defeated. It does, it certainly does. And, and the interesting irony is that precisely we've already had state propagandists in Russia who are arguing that this is, of course, all a put-up job and these people are actors or whatever. Mm. And they're saying, because, of course, it actually benefits Ukraine and it benefits the hawks in the West. Why would we have allowed something like this to happen? Um, so, you know, there, there's always these kind of narratives that, that get spun. But no, you're, you're absolutely right. But again, I mean, I think that um, we have seen in the past that one, you know, one would have thought, for example, that the MH17 shootdown, in which Russian proxies using a Russian-supplied surface-to-air missile blow a jumbo jet out of out of the air, and then deny and misdirect and try to uh, interfere with investigations and so forth, you know, one would have thought then that that would have been another one of these. We passed a red line; there can be no return, and yet it actually soon becomes history. Mm. And interestingly enough, I, I mean, I remember talking to, to a friend of mine who was actually, in, in, you know, uh, a Dutchman, who was actually saying he's amazed that even in, in the Netherlands, there's a, there's a large contingent of people who still, who now, in effect, accept that the Russian narrative, not that it, of a specific Western plot or whatever, but just of a, well, we'll never know what's going on. You know, we've seen the limits of Russian disinformation during the Ukrainian war in that it can't create alternative narratives that stick. But on the other hand, the strength of Russian disinformation is precisely in trying to create the sense of uncertainty. Not that here is an alternative narrative, but well, that we'll never really know and truth is entirely subjective and so forth. So again, however much uh, moral outrage we see and hear and indeed feel right now, I think the Russian calculus will be that, you know, give, give it a year, maybe even two years, and it'll just be another historical incident like Srebrenica or Rwanda or whatever. Yeah, understood. It um, takes us on uh, to your new book, The Weaponization of Everything, A Field Guide to the New Way of War. And I'm talking to the author, Mark Galliotti, on our Authors in Conversation series. If you're not a subscriber to Reaction on YouTube, just hit the subscribe button. And also, uh, you can also sign up to my weekly newsletter on politics and get all the uh, other stuff from the from the team. So explain this uh, this new and it's a very timely book. But it, it it explain this this theory of 
hybrid warfare, this different uh, world into which we're, we're moving, which doesn't exclude, as you can see in Ukraine, the possibility of a real live shooting war. But you paint a picture of a, a very different landscape in which, uh, in which we're going to be dealing with sanctions, disinformation, very, makes it very difficult for the democracies, for free societies to protect themselves and have to live in a really a heightened state of awareness. Yes, I mean, look, my basic thesis is that in many ways, war is becoming too expensive in obviously financial terms, but also political and social terms to really wage that easily or that lightly. I mean, again, as, as, as Vladimir Putin will, will tell you, there are still going to be those regimes which will actually fight the old fashioned kinetic conflict. But in the main, it's actually becoming much less useful. And especially because actually power and wealth now are very rarely measured in terms of square miles of farmland or a particular coal mine or all the kind of physical things that you could grab. No one could, for example, invade Silicon Valley in the United States and think that when they invade the real estate, they get all the, the technological know-how, the innovation, the entrepreneurship that renders that. I mean, now increasingly resources are virtual, they are intellectual, and, and these are not things that you can, you can conquer with, it, with a tank or, or an aircraft. But on the other hand, that said, and, and it's also a negative element, I should add, that it's not just the costs of war, you know, in which we do find, I mean, if, if one looks at the moment in, in Ukraine, um, as well as the British supplied NLAW anti-tank weapons. There are these rather larger and heavier American javelins. Now, a javelin missile, firing a javelin missile from, from, from its uh, reusable launcher, well, that, that missile costs about $12,000. And that missile can take out a $10 million tank. You know, often actually the arithmetic doesn't work, but also nowadays most societies have to think about how their people will, will feel. The age when you could sort of wave the flower of uh, working class manhood off to the fields of Flanders and expect that you can not only allow them to die in their thousands, but that that will not have a dramatic political cost long since gone. Nowadays, every flag draped coffin coming back has a political impact. And even authoritarian regimes, you know, we're, we're seeing already that in Russia, they're actually beginning to worry about the impact of, of the casualties and the dead. So. Regular war is much less useful, shall we say, as a tool of tradecraft. But all the pressures, all the rivalries, all the competitions that have been there ever since there have been states, well, they're still there. And in some ways, they're even more unfettered because we don't have the Cold War as a sort of artificial organizing mechanism, which in a way allowed the East and West to manage com conflict, often by just simply outsourcing it into the global South, into places like Afghanistan or Angola or Vietnam or Nicaragua. So my view is precisely that given that the pressures are still going to be there, the trend is exactly that competition, that warfare will increasingly precisely be fought in these new realms. I mean, if we look at what's going on in Ukraine, there is, you might say, a very traditional war happening within Ukraine, a 20th century war, shall we say. And there's a very, very 21st century war being fought between the West and Russia in that, <coughs> excuse me, in that um, economic warfare, legal warfare, political warfare, yeah. cultural warfare are all being deployed against Moscow. So in, in some ways, we're already seeing that actually play out. And then how does... How does influence fit into that? Because you talk in the book about the role of big data, disinformation, e e even one, you know, short of full scale cyber warfare, just spreading of di disinformation and subversion in 21st century um, geo geopolitics. But but what about the att the attempts which the Russians have obviously made? Um, and there's a lot of smoke and mirrors involved as well. But over the course of the last 20 years at, at um, buying influence or at, um, at playing a role, primarily initially through just a wealth acquisition and acquisition of things like property, but then spreading out into, into, into public life. Uh, do you think that was, is that deliberate, do you think, or is it just a process that has emerged 
naturally as the as the west was a bit too naive about it and there was so much gas and mineral and oil wealth and it spread out into the west and one thing led to another and it became um classified as a doctrine but do you think it was deliberate to be honest i think in the russian case it wasn't or at least certainly not originally it was actually that you know rich russians uncertain of the future of what happened back in russia were looking to internationalize their wealth yeah and and move it essentially you know their, their model was to steal at home and bank abroad um and and that that's what they were doing however in some ways i think what we then saw is the chinese following on in a much much more purposeful way and you know we all know about huawei and the whole issues about allowing that to essentially embed itself within our 5g backbone but i think Huawei is just one example of, of a whole series of companies that are doing this. Because look, what it comes down to it, what is war? War is just simply a way of forcing another country to do something it doesn't want to do. And at times and in, in certain in situations, then the, the best way of doing that is to march an army into their capital city and plant your flag on top of their government building. In the modern world, there are just so many other ways to do it. If actually you know, a single assassin's bullet or a single word that's sort of whispered into the right ear, backed by the right amount of money, or indeed a particularly powerful meme that creates a social movement. I mean, if all of these do the same job, they're all a lot cheaper, a lot easier, and a lot more covert hmm. than actually military action. And I think this is something that in some ways, I mean, the Russians really, they, they stole a march on us because they had to. You had a regime, particularly under Putin, that was trying to reassert for Russia a place as a great power, even though, frankly, it wasn't. Militarily, economically, in terms of soft power, in any of the classic indices, it even, wasn't. Even its, even its demographics, just in terms of the way in which it's, it has this demographic time bomb at the heart of uh, Russian society. Precisely. So, I mean, so for all these reasons, you know, they, they realised that, you might say, by the conventional measures, they could not assert that, that status. So like good geopolitical guerrillas, they moved the battlefield to where they felt they were strongest or more to the point where they felt we were weakest. And Putin and his thinkers, they have identified as far as they're concerned that what is our biggest weakness? It is that we are a constellation of democracies with all kinds of disagreements within and between our countries and societies. And that's what they identified as the, the weak points to exploit, whether it was with influence or disinformation or whatever else. Mm. And where the Russians went, others have also followed. And I think this is, the, this is the thing. It's not just simply about Russia and the West. In some ways, Russia for me is, I wouldn't say a declining power, but I would say a declining threat. Not least because I think the next political generation, who will just simply be pragmatic kleptocrats, will be more willing to deal with us because, again, they want to be able to enjoy the fruits of engagement with the West. Uh, there's going to be all kinds of other insurgent powers. I mentioned China, but you know we already see similar tactics being used by Iran to a degree, even by North Korea. You know there, there are other people who have I, I identified this as a potential route to asserting their power, and and that's why we need to be thinking about it now because it's not just a question of well once Putin goes, the world will be yeah. bathed in light and happiness. So in t in terms of responding to that you map out how we live in an era of uh, financial warfare. Now, sanctions, the sanctions that the West have used in the aftermath of the invasion, I mean, how effective do you think they are being or will be and what more can be done? I mean, I think they are effective, but we have to appreciate that sanctions are not a lightning weapon. Um, that, you know, actually, if you look at the damage being done to the Russian economy, which inevitably is absolutely going to communicate to its capacity to wage wars, both overt and covert. Well, that damage is being done, will continue to be done, and the scarring will last for a long time, even if sanctions were lifted tomorrow. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we that we're therefore have to expect that it'll instantly make things better. It is, in some ways, we trade off risk to ourselves for time. We want to do something quickly, then we'd have to do something much more risky. As is, we, we've made certain decisions because at least, if nothing else, this is something that we can, as a unified Western society, 
that we, that we actually have managed to, to, to agree on, which is pretty amazing, it has to be said. It's not often that we have this kind of consensus. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that what we really need to think about doing was what are we actually aiming to do? If the aim is regime change, if the aim is just simply to get Russia out of Ukraine, if the aim is to deny Putin the capacity, not just to, to continue to fight a war in Ukraine now, but to then reinvade in two years or five years time. Well, I mean, each of those has different parameters and therefore sort of indicates we should have different types of sanctions and actions. Key thing I would say is we talk about the economic sanctions and they are, of course, the central part of our response. But we shouldn't assume it's just that. We also, we are waging actually increasingly effective information war against Russia. We are also waging a political struggle to try and divide Putin from his own elites and to divide his own elites. We're involved in a, in a cultural war to try and convince Russians that they're going to find themselves on the wrong side of history. And that if they really want to be part of the, you know, the modern European West, they need to be doing other things. These are all parts of it. And again, none of them is a lightning weapon, but they all have mm. a slow burn power that is actually really quite substantial. But how do you, you've written so much about Russia and understanding uh, modern Russia, but how hopeful are you or otherwise that post Putin, whether that's in one month or one year or in 10 years time, that post Putin, that it's feasible for, for Russia with the way that Russians seem to think about Russia's role in the world as a, as a great power, which although it has large numbers of nuclear warheads isn't really on any conventional model and is going to become less uh, less powerful if the West successfully unhooks itself from Russia's energy supply. So post-Ukraine, the prospects for Russia becoming a greater power are, uh, you know, are, are, are diminished. How do you think Russians will, and it's very difficult to poll Russia or to get any accurate sense of what the, the, the center of Russian opinion uh, thinks the mainstream how do you think russians will react to that or do they want to be part of a sort of main mainstream civilized uh, european community of nations oh, look, i mean again we shouldn't assume there's going to be just some some epiphany whereby all of russia suddenly thinks actually no we need to do something different but on the other hand i mean as brits we understand that end of empire can be a hard thing to get used to mm -hmm. and takes a long time um, you know, the French are also going, going through this. The Americans will probably soon have to start coming to terms with it themselves. And I think, you know, we, this is something that we have to think of in, in, in generational terms. Now, look, I am unfashionably optimistic in the long term about Russia. And I think what's interesting is if one look at, looks at Putin and the people who are closest to him and share his same ideological perspective, on the whole, they are... 68 to 72 year olds. You know, they are in many ways the true last gasp of the Homo Sovieticus. Um, and indeed, in many of the cases, they broke into the system. They, they did not come from um, families that had already been in power within the communist system. You know, they, they were the first ones who finally broke into the power elite just to have that system collapse around them. And I think that, that's given an additional sort of uh, sort of edge to why they respond the way they respond. We often talk about the generational divides within Russia. And what that tends to be uh, mean is we contrast sort of 20 year olds who are willing to go out on the streets and protest with uh, you know, the Putin generation. In some ways, I'm more interested in the 50 year olds and the early 60 year olds who are gonna be the next leaders of this country. These are on the whole, not nice people. They are ruthless, pragmatic, opportunistic kleptocrats. However, what I don't get from them is quite that same visceral feeling that not just that something was taken from them, but that actually it was a deliberate decision. It's not, you know, not, not just what do we lose, but who took it from us, which I think is what you very much get, get from Putin and, and his cohorts. There is a clear anger, a sense of resentment, a sense that the West has done Russia down and that countries like Ukraine are essentially traitors to, to the motherland. Yeah. And it's that emotional edge, I think, that really makes this so dangerous. 
the, 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 the generation below them who are frankly, I think quite sort of patiently looking at their watches thinking, hang on, when, when do we get our turn at, at the top? Um, uh, they, they are, I think exactly, people who will just simply want to do what's in their, and to a lesser extent, their country's interests. Mm. And they will steal and, and, and they will generally be unpleasant people. But on the other hand, they have every incentive to have a better relationship with the West. So not slightly, least because they yeah. fear China. So, so, so slightly less likely to fall for this, uh, and it was it was there in 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 Putin's infamous essay, and in some mm -hmm. of the writers that the that the Kremlin has has promoted. It's been there, obvious, in the last two or three years. This Putin doctrine of Greater Russia, and you can see why the the Poles should be very nervous, and why the Baltics should be very ner nervous. This idea of a, it's almost pre pre Soviet pre Lenin notion of imperialist Russian mm -hmm. expansion and great civilization, which, I mean, in the end, obviously, if he wants to go the whole whole way, leads to Constantinople, if you're thinking in terms of mm. reuni reunifying a Russian Russian Christian worldview. So they're less like, do you, you think they're just more likely to be less hooked up on all that sort of Madness. I think so. I mean, more I think, practical. again, the, these are people who I think believe that, that sort of stronger powers prey on weaker powers. I don't think they have a moral problem with the sort of behavior that, frankly, was normal in the 19th century. Yeah. But on the other hand, I don't think they, they, they have this sense of, a sense of an ideological value. The more it says we are right and moral in doing this. But there is also one other point is that Russia is on the cusp of one of the greatest intergenerational transfers of wealth that the world has ever seen as those people who stole on an industrial scale in the 1990s, oligarchs and minigarchs and the like, start thinking themselves about succession and handing the money over. Now, when you're stealing, you want there to be no laws. Once you've stolen everything that isn't nailed down, you want there to be laws to fix it away and protect your wealth and to allow you to transfer it to your heirs without there being challenged. And often that they look at the sort of their, their heirs the pampered little darlings and think, not only do I not want them to have to fight the way I had to fight for my money, but I don't think they probably could fight that way. Mm -hmm. So I think what we probably will see is interestingly rule of law finally coming to Russia and under these ruthless kleptocrats, simply because, well, that's how the, the pattern tends to be, mm -hmm. that the robber barons become the upholders of, of the status quo once they finish robbing. And the interesting thing is this, you can have rule of law without democracy, but you can't have democracy without rule of law. And in the 1990s, they tried in some ways to bring democracy to Russia without rule of law, and it didn't work. Yeah. If the next political generation can be the rule of law generation, which is not guaranteed, but I think you know, that there are reasons to think that it will, the generation after that maybe will be the democrat generation. So you know, I, it's not that I think that Russia will be part of a wider European family of nations anytime soon. But I do think that in terms of tectonic drift, if nothing else, there is an awareness. Again, if I, if I can quote actually a, a Russian retired army officer from, from some years back, I think it's about five years ago now. Anyway, his prediction was that in 20 years from there, Russia will either have had to have become an ally of the West of some kind, you know, not talking about European Union membership or anything like that, but an ally of the West of some kind, or it will be a vassal of China of some kind. Exactly. And that's the very stark choice. And frankly, if they're gonna make that choice, then they're absolutely gonna be Europeans. Because in, in, in Putin's imagining at the Winter Olympics, the idea of being, of this deal with China, it was in, in, in his fevered imagination, it's, it's a partnership of equals. But actually, of course, that's not how the, how the Chinese see it. And if this carries on, and uh, the Russian economy is eroded in the way that it's um, being by sanctions, and they're ostensibly defeated in Ukraine, then it definitely will be uh, be a, a you know sort of vassal state of, um, of of China. Just two just two questions to to finish on, Mark. Firstly, what does this mean for how we should think about European security? By which I mean everything running from Sweden and Finland not in NATO to the UK, a leading power in NATO and a leading intelligence power, but not in the European Union. 
what do we need to do? I mean, it, it, maybe it's you described a more a really interesting, longer term optimistic take on where Russia might end up. But how do we protect ourselves and build the security structure and architecture over the next year or so that's going to endure and secure the European democracies? Well, it's interesting because NATO is currently going through the process of developing its next kind of strategic vision document. And there is this question about how it copes in a world in which there are still very clear kinetic threats, military threats, and yet also that there's such a, a range of other types of threat as well. And of course, the temptation is therefore to say, well, NATO will do, do all of them. But of course, you know, the old dictum is if, if you defend everything, you defend nothing. And NATO has been phenomenally effective because of, in some ways, the simplicity of its message. It is precisely, it is, it is a structure for solidarity against military threat. And an attack on one is an attack on all. And it's very successful at that. It's interesting, even though, even, even at times when we in the West were thinking, well, how unified is NATO? Um, you know, would the Americans under, for example, Donald Trump really come to you know, Europe's support? Would the Spaniards fight for Estonia and so forth? The Russians, basically, they never really thought that there was any question, in part because they're just mirror imaging and they think of NATO as America's Warsaw Pact. And so they don't think anyone, as it were, would, would get a vote. But nonetheless, the point is, it is very successful. And the fact is that I think the Russians regard NATO as being pretty much bulletproof against overt direct military threats. But of course, if, if, if NATO tries to do everything, look, it cannot parachute forensic accountants into European capitals to deal with corruption or influence buying or, or that kind of thing. Hmm. Really, the issue is actually whether the European Union is going to be able to, to step up meaningfully. At the moment, a lot of the debate around this new what they call strategic compass is being hijacked by the sense of a European army, which I think would be something of a, of a wrong uh, step. Not least because yeah, I mean, it's, I it's, a, it's a bit of it's a bit of a, a, I always think of it as a bit of a diversion actually because it I mean you can if you're being critical of the of, of, of the French and there is a there's a French presidential election on as we're as we as we're speaking then it, it has it obviously has a Gaullist Im, implication doesn't it because it is a European army which reduces reliance on the Americans and eventually even sort of removes America from the sphere of European influence. Now that's, I, you can see why that fits with French politics, but it certainly doesn't fit with uh, German politics longer term, and it doesn't fit with the interests of a country like Sweden or Finland, who want to keep the Americans involved and certainly want the British involved. And also it doesn't really create any new forces. It just simply means the same forces, you know, one day they'll have a national cap on, and then they'll be wearing a NATO beret, and then maybe it'll be a European Union helmet. But it's the same soldiers in pretty much every case. No, but I think the thing is about this whole new way of war, the new battle space is in many ways governance. It's actually about, you know, are there divisions and discontented minorities within our country which can be mobilized by, by enemy disinformation? Are there failures of financial regulation, which means that dirty money can come in and buy influence and set up media outlets and such like? And all of these things, when it comes down to it, these are all about governance. Governance is meant to be the thing that the EU does well. So in, 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 my, in my view, actually, this is really going to be a challenge for the European Union. Individual countries, of course, and everyone always kind of raises the Finns as the sort of the, the gold standard in resilience, mm. um, which is... I mean, it, it is true, but it's not actually as if necessarily that the Finnish model is one that we could apply elsewhere. But, you know, we, we, we have to look at ways in which we, we think about, we think strategically about our vulnerabilities. And we appreciate that something like, you know, dirty money coming in and inevitably creating a whole network of enablers. That is not just a question of financial regulation. That is also a security issue. Yeah, I think this is it. We need to think about that. We need to think about the extent to which actually certain forms of organized crime can be weaponized by our enemies as instruments against us and therefore treat them as you know particular priorities. It's a whole variety of ways that we just need to be putting security, domestic security, much more sort of front and center. Yes, mm -hmm. we need to be spending our appropriate amounts on you know direct military forces and such like. But if I'm just give one, one more example, 
I once did, a, I mean, it was hard to get at, you know, exact figures, but I once did a comparison of the proportion of GDP that NATO countries spend on counterintelligence. In other words, you know, stopping enemy spying. Now we have with NATO, this notional figure of 2% of GDP should be spent on defense. This debate as to, you know, how actually you count it and whether it's the right figure, but it gives that sense that there is a single standard and no one should be a free rider. Well, the spend on counterintelligence is literally, there are differences of orders of magnitude between countries and UK comes out quite high on this, which spend seriously and countries that, that shockingly spend little. I mean, Belgium, the, the Belgian counterintelligence service only had five people working on Russians. And that's despite the fact that, you know, Belgium, Brussels, headquarters of the European Union. Hmm. And in an alliance structure, the, again, the weakness of one member is a weakness for everyone because information gets shared and, and everything else. So again, it, it's also thinking about our responsibilities to our partners, whether that's NATO, whether that's European Union, whether that's the UK with European powers that it wishes to cooperate with or whatever. Mm. But again, it's this sense that we need, just need to take security broadly conceptualized much more seriously. Where on earth does Hungary fit into that, do you think? Well, Hungary is an interesting case. I mean, well, it's worth mentioning Hungary spends quite quite solidly on counterintelligence. So probably it's more because it wants to hide what it's doing from Brussels than anything else. Um, but, but again, this speaks to that whole issue of the fact that within, within democracies, you are going to have certain discontented, and sometimes it's going to be national minorities or particular schools of thought within a country. And sometimes within a constellation of powers, it's going to be individual countries that are the awkward squad and, and create trouble. And again, at the moment, the European Union has largely thought of Hungary as being a regulatory challenge. These people are not following our, our, our rules properly, and therefore we need to, to treat it in that way, rather than thinking of it as a security challenge, which is it undoubtedly is. Mm -hmm. Now, look, Viktor Orban is not some kind of puppet of Putin's, any more than, for example, uh, Czech President uh, Zeman is. Um, these are generally populist opportunists who like being able to play Russia and Brussels off against each other and sort of make them give that sense of I, I, I could go another way, you know. Mm. Um, but they can do that precisely because they're given that freedom of maneuver. And I, and I think, therefore, you know, actually, the, these represent serious challenges to, to, to structures. We need to be aware that all of these vulnerabilities actually have security implications that our enemies, whoever they may be, will obviously seek to exploit. Final question, Mark. You mentioned the Gerasimov doctrine in the, in the, in the book. Um, well, firstly, could you explain what it is and, and, and explain to us how it's faring when it's being tested in Ukraine? Yes, the, the, the Gerasimov doctrine, I will have that albatross round my neck for the rest of my life in that it's something that doesn't exist, but nonetheless, I create it. In, it was a, um, a particular speech by the Russian chief of the general staff, Valery Gerasimov, that uh, he gave in 2013 and was then reprinted in the thoroughly exciting page turner of the military industrial courier in, in Russia. And... Um, someone I knew had done a translation and sent it to me. And I thought, oh, this is quite interesting. People should have, be aware of it. So I put it on my blog in Moscow Shadows um, with my own sort of commentary on it. And because, look, a blog is an exercise in vanity. I wanted people to read it. So I gave it this title of, in quote marks, the Gerasimov Doctrine, because it, sort of, it had that thick airport paperback kind of resonance. Even though I made it clear in the actual commentary that this was not actually a doctrine. Because what Gerasimov was describing was how the Russians think that we in the West operate. They look at things like the Arab Spring risings, the colored revolutions in post-Soviet states, um, the Euromaidan in Ukraine in 2013-14, and indeed what we've just most recently seen in Belarus. And instead of seeing these as the natural organic risings of people who are thoroughly fed up with corrupt and unresponsive governments, they think, aha, these are all political operations generated by the CIA. With MI6, it has to be said, usually getting a supporting role. And as part of how the West destabilizes and brings down regimes it doesn't like. 
And, you know, this was basically very much speaking to the kind of paranoias of the time uh, in, in Putin and his circle. Unfortunately, what happened is in the West, the title, the Gerasimov Doctrine, that, that, that obviously sort of was, was, was sexy, it encapsulated an idea. It really caught on, yeah. Crimea and this sort of easy, easy seizure of Crimea using all sorts of misdirections and so forth. And it was presented as if this was actually a kind of a Russian playbook. It's not. I mean, Russian generals plan and train for regular military warfare, just, just like ours. But the interesting thing is, if one looks at Ukraine, right up to the point when Putin invaded, I would suggest he was winning. He was winning a 21st century non-weaponized warfare. He had this huge military force around the Ukrainian border. But nonetheless, it wasn't moving. It wasn't costing him much. It was an exercise in heavy metal diplomacy, in intimidation. And because of that, the Ukrainian economy was tanking. It was, you know, basically no one wanted to invest because they didn't know what was going to happen. We had a whole stream of Western politicians traveling to Moscow to see Putin, which is exactly where he likes to be in the center of things, you know, the supplicants coming to see him, mm. sitting at the end of the ludicrously long tables. And we also had the, the unedifying spectacle of certain European countries beginning to try and put pressure on President Zelensky to make concessions to the Russians precisely to avoid war. And if he'd been truly Machiavellian, if he had been this geopolitical chess player, he would have just allowed this situation to continue with the Americans periodically warning of, of invasions. Yeah. And then when those dates pass, he could just, just simply say to the Europeans, so why are the Americans lying to you? And what else do you think they're lying to you about? Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, Ukraine would have had more and more under pressure to, to make concessions. For whatever reason, I think in part because he, he likes to feel that he's the active one. I don't think he's very patient. But the point is, as soon as his tanks crossed the border, he started losing. And I think, again, although at first I was thinking, my, you know, does this uh, undermine the thesis of my book? In some ways, I think that nice Vladimir Vladimirovich has actually proved the thesis, is that actually, as, as long as he was using non-military means, he was being very successful. But the military means are proving catastrophically ineffective and catastrophically expensive, and frankly, will ultimately bring down his system. Mark Galliotti, thank you very much for joining us. We've been talking about your prescient book. We need to talk about Putin, how the West uh, gets him wrong, and also about your new book, The Weaponization of Everything. I'm Ian Martin. You've been watching Authors in Conversation on Reaction. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm.